Hello again, and welcome to the second of our series of three webinars on the new charity Statement of Recommended Practice, or SORP. My name is Ewan Morrison, and I'm Head of Charities at Chain and & Tate, and in this session I will cover the Statement of Financial Activities and selected accounting treatments under the new SORP. As I mentioned in the last webinar, the accounting framework that applies within the UK to all entities, not just charities, is UK generally accepted accounting practice, and this has recently changed with the introduction of the Financial Reporting Standard 102. With the changes to the general standards, the specialised areas of accounting have therefore had to follow suit. And the outcome of this is that we have a raft of new sorts, which include the charity sort, the pension sort, and one for housing associations. The new SORPs have come into effect for accounting periods commencing on or after 1st of January 2015. So if you have a December year end, the 31st December 15 accounts will be the first to change. Similarly, for March year ends, the March 16 accounts will be the first affected. And in all cases, comparative figures will also need to be restated. Now, you may have heard about something called the transition date, and this is the first day of the comparative period. It's important because if you have to recalculate balances as a result of different treatments under the new SORP, it's from this date that they must change. As an example, in the case of a December year end, the transition date would be 1st January 2014. Now, there are two different versions of the charity SORP. All charities may apply the FRS 102 sort, and if your charity's figures exceed the small company limits in the Companies Act, you must apply this version. Now, the current thresholds for a small company are income of 6.5 million, gross assets of 3.26 million, and 50 employees. If you're under two out of these three, you're generally deemed to be small. Where you are small in this context, you may alternatively report under the Financial Reporting Standard for Smaller Entities, or FRISI, version of the charity SORP. Unfortunately, you can't pick and choose between the two versions, and you must apply all the relevant requirements of the one that you use. And another key point is that for accounting periods commencing on or after the 1st January 2016, the FRISI and the FRISI SORP will be withdrawn, and therefore even if you qualify to use it, it would be for one year only. We'll now look at the Statement of Financial Activities, or SOFA, and the key changes from the current charity SORP. I'll focus on the FRS 102 version of the SORP, but I've added notes in the slides where the FRISI SORP is different. So firstly, terminology and headings have changed and we'll look at this in more detail shortly. The next change applies if you have an investment such as property that's let out or an investment portfolio, and it relates to the position on the statement of financial activities that the gains and losses are reported. Again, we'll look at this in a moment. Governance costs, which are the costs relating to constitutional or strategic matters, and these would normally include audit fees or trustee meeting costs. These costs have now been relegated from the, the face of the SOFA to the notes of the accounts. The final key change in respect to the SOFA itself is that the comparative figures must now be disclosed in the same level of detail as the current year's figures, i.e. they would be separated into restricted, unrestricted, endowment funds as applicable. Now, as you can imagine, this could involve cramming significantly more figures onto the SOFA itself, and that could make the SOFA quite difficult to read clearly. Options that you have to deal with this might be to use a landscape format for the SOFA, include perhaps a full comparative SOFA within the notes to the accounts, or maybe take the approach of the sort-making body's own example accounts and provide the required information as a narrative with each relevant note. So we'll start with looking at income for the SOFA. Here we have the current SORP headings, and next to them 
are the headings under the new charity sort. As you can see, the headings are similar, and the main change is that the terminology is clearer. For instance, voluntary income becomes donations and legacies, which is much more helpful to users of accounts. And the nature of the income within each category is also unchanged from the current sort that you're familiar with. Expenditure, they're returning to, there are more changes. Again, on the left-hand side, we have the old headings, and on the right-hand side, the new ones. As you can see, six categories have been reduced to three. The first three, which relate to costs associated with raising income, have been combined into a single simpler heading that makes more sense. Charitable activities costs remain, but the slightly odd category of governance costs has, as I noted previously, now been relegated to the notes. It's important to note that all the items on the left-hand side must still, however, be set out in the notes to the accounts. The part of the sofa below the income expenditure is where one of the bigger changes has occurred for charities with investment assets. Various headings on the left you'll be familiar with. For most of them, nothing changes, and they're in line with the sort on the right. Where there is change is this category of realised and unrealised gains or losses on assets held for investment. And this has now been promoted to slot in above net income and expenditure in the new sort. This is important because investment gains and losses can fluctuate quite significantly year on year. And in turn, this means that the net income and expenditure will vary accordingly. Net income and expenditure is part of the accounts that people will focus on quite closely when they're reading them. So that's why this is key. Fortunately, it is possible under the new sort to add subheadings to the SOFA to make it more informative. And therefore, it would be reasonable to add a heading above net gains or losses on investments along the lines of net income and expenditure before net gains or losses on investments. Let's move on to some accounting treatment changes now. Under the current sort, there are three conditions to meet before you recognise income. Firstly, the charity must be entitled to it. Secondly, it must be possible to quantify it reliably. And the final condition is that of certainty i.e. the income must be virtually certain. Under the FRS 102 sort, the first two conditions are unchanged, but the third changes from being certain to being probable. And probable in this context is defined as more likely than not. As you can imagine, this would potentially mean having to recognise income earlier than we would have previously. If, for example, somebody pledges to donate to the charity before the year end, but no funds were received at the balance sheet date, you would likely only recognise this income when you received it after the year end, as it was not certain until that point. Going forward, however, if you think you will probably receive it, it should be recognised when the pledge is given. So there's lots to think about here if you have income of this nature. Another change in relation to income recognition relates to income received from goods donated for distribution or resale. Currently, these are recognised at the point you pass them on or sell them and at the price you receive for them. Under the new sort, these should be accounted for when they are received and also at fair value at that point. Now, valuing goods at the point of receipt may be easier for some types of goods than it would be for others. If, for example, your charity receives a painting by a well-known artist, this could probably be valued relatively easily. If, on the other hand, you receive bags of second-hand clothes, it would be very difficult to place a value on them. Luckily, there's a concession here, whereby that it's impractical to value donated items on receipt can revert to the old treatment of recognition and valuation of disposal. Now, while we are looking at income, the specific guidance in the 2005 SORP in relation to legacies has been helpfully expanded upon in the new SORP, 
So if you're in the position of receiving legacies, there is more information there for you. We've covered income recognition, so we'll now talk about expenditure. Where a charity has a liability, which it won't settle for more than 12 months after the balance sheet date, under the new SORPs, it must account for the time value of money by discounting it to its present value. Now, this is only required where a discount adjustment would be material, and examples of where this might apply would be accruals of commitments to pay grants over a number of years, or perhaps loans between related or grouped entities. Another change to accounting for accruals is in respect of holiday pay. Charities should now accrue for the cost of holidays not taken by staff at the year end. This is only likely to be an issue if staff are allowed to carry forward holidays or if the holiday year is not coterminous with the accounting period end. But regardless, you'll need to work out the figure in order that it can be confirmed if it's material or not. The next slide focuses on what are called financial instruments. And these are arrangements that could give rise to a financial exchange of some kind. And the new sort gives much more detail on how these sorts of instruments should be accounted for. So there are two forms of financial instruments described in the new SORP. The first of, of these they call BASIC, and this category includes the common financial assets and liabilities such as cash, trade creditors, ordinary investments, and loans at market rates of interest. This basic category must be accounted for based on the present value of future payments or receipts discounted at what's called the effective rate of interest. Calculating this precisely can be complex, but in practice, basic instruments that are payable on demand, due within 12 months, or to which a market rate of interest applies, will likely be accounted for on historic cost as they currently are. It's with the other category of financial instruments where things become a bit more interesting. Imaginatively, this category is termed other and comprises anything that falls out with the basic category. In case you're wondering where this comes from, it's actually from Financial Reporting Standard 102 itself. And examples of items included within this category are interest rate swaps and foreign exchange contracts. In terms of the accounting, these must be measured at fair value, with the movement being recognised in the Statement of Financial Activities. I'll take this opportunity to cover a couple of other points on the accounts in general under the new SORPs. The first is on what were known as cash flow statements, and going forward will be called statements of cash flow. Again, we have FRS 102 to thank for that terminology change. So under the FRS 102 SORP, statements of cash flow are now mandatory. Under the existing rules, if you qualify as a small company, they are optional as they are under the Frizzy SORP. In practice, what this means is that charities will be required to prepare a statement of cash flows once the Frizzy SORP expires, although it does now look likely that there may be an exemption introduced for small charities in due course. With regard to the actual preparation of the statement of cash flow, helpfully the new SORP does now provide detailed guidance, and that's something that wasn't there in the previous SORP. The final point to mention is in relation to prior adjustments for the new SORP. As I noted previously, balances will need to be restated from the transition date along with comparatives, and this is to ensure consistency and comparability to the readers of the accounts. The new SORP additionally stipulates that errors in the previous year, which are material, should be corrected by way of prior year adjustment. Under current rules, only errors that are fundamental to the accounts, which was generally a higher level, need to be corrected in this way. So there is a, an important distinction there. So I've covered the main changes to this statement of financial activities and also various amendments to accounting treatments. But what steps do you need to take now? 
Well, to start with, decide if you can, and you indeed want to, use the Frizzy version of the new sort. But remember, it's only available for one year if you want to use a Frizzy. Next, have you all the information that you'll need? And this would include analyses of figures for comparatives, or perhaps interest rates for calculations. Are the trustees aware of the changes and the impact of them? For instance, the requirement to recognise income earlier than before could be one change that might be significant. If you have investment assets, think about how your net income or expenditure will now look in terms of presentation. And finally, will the readers of your accounts, such as funders, will they understand any significant changes? For more information then on the new SORPs, there is a very good website set up by the SORP making body. And this allows you to download copies of the different SORPs. And it also has useful help sheets that include one showing the main changes from the previous SORP. In addition, it has example accounts, which now include Scottish ones. Of course, Chain and Tate will be very pleased to assist you with your transition to FRS 102 and the new SORPs. Well, I hope this webinar has been helpful to you. And I'll just highlight the other two we have in our series. The first, which is available on our website, dealt with the trustees report. And the final one, which will cover the balance sheet and related notes, will be released soon.